we'll now do more or less exactly one hour, not at least as a, not a second longer than one hour, because we need to be somewhere else very soon. Uh, so uh, um, let's see about the dynamics. But the same rules apply as uh, before. Raise your hand, and I don't miss anyone. I trust me, and I have other uh, uh, people are helping me as well to make sure that I'm not missing anyone. So just raise your hand, and uh, but it's not. Uh, you cannot count on the fact that you will immediately get to say something, but uh, you will be noticed. Uh, on my left is uh, Christoph Bender, who is the vice chairman of the ESI, the European Stability Initiative, uh, which is based uh, in Vienna, which has been based in, in lots of places, Istanbul and, 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 and uh, uh, Paris and, and, and elsewhere. But uh, uh, Christoph has been doing work on... Uh, Southeastern Europe, above all, for a very, very, very long time. Uh, and if you want to add something to that, you can do that when you, <laughs> when you take the microphone. And on my uh, right is uh, Ognjan Georgiev, uh, who is a journalist with uh, uh, the journal Capital. Uh, he's running uh, one part of that called Capital Insights. Uh, uh, but he has also done a lot of uh, uh, reporting most recently or uh, not so long ago in the US as the pandemic actually uh, started, uh, uh, which he will be able to bring into this uh, discussion here this morning um, as well. But of course also has uh, uh, a Bulgarian perspective from within. Uh, so I would... Uh, however, I'd like to start with you, Christoph, uh, because um, uh, the, the first part of this discussion this morning uh, sort of uh, laid the stage for uh, this discussion. Um, so the question is, uh, so we have a, a problem. People are talking about the demographic catastrophe and there are issues here. But what do you really do when you see that problem uh, and think about how to solve it? Uh, would it be to build a wall to stop people from, from moving? Would it be to give up the idea of the free movement, uh, one of the pillars of the, of the European Union? Uh, the answer to that is obviously no. So you have a different situation. And what is that? Uh, thanks very much, and uh, good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. Thanks for coming. Um, well, I, I think there is no way denying that kind of countries who face a larger outflow of their citizens towards other countries face a number of challenges. But I think um, it's very difficult to how should I say to address in a, in a direct way. Kind of, I know Senat yesterday suggested, or you know, that the German basically there too much trying to attract people from the Western Balkans, from, from Bosnia and other countries. But I mean, I, I think that from Bulgaria as well, of course, yes. Um, but I, I don't really think that this is a very promising way to go. I mean, for those who are members or citizens of EU member states, it's a, it's a right, you know, to basically move everywhere. Uh, this is partially what the European Union is all about, and I, I think it's very difficult to, to, to sort of backtrack on, on this. And also for the Western Balkans, I know, I know, who are we to tell a young Bosnian that, you know, no, 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 you, you don't take up this uh, job offer in Germany, but you basically stay stuck somewhere in, in Vitesse and, and, and be happy if you find a job which pays uh, 300 um, um, euros. So I think, and all this debate in Germany about kind of the, the lack of uh, qualified uh, workers for which uh, Germans, of course, have invented a nice word, uh, uh, Fachkräftelücke, um, uh, is, 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 is a, a, a very important theme there. And I think, uh, you know, so Germany will continue to attract people from around and it's easiest for people in other EU countries to move there, and it also has become relatively easy for, for people in the, in, the, in the Western Balkans. 
Fach think, Fachkräfte Lücke with a skilled labor gap. Exactly, right? yes, 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 yes. But in, so, so I think to, to a certain extent this is unavoidable. Um, but the, the question, I think, the, the crucial question is for how long is this dynamic going to continue? And it can be very long. You know? Ireland, for example, in well, nearly 200 years ago, in 1841, Ireland had 8.2 million inhabitants, the whole island, right? And then it started to fall. And relatively soon after, you had sort of the end of the Great Hunger, but, but still numbers fell and fell and fell for 90 years. You know, In, in, in 1931, there were 4.2 million people on the Irish island, yeah? virtually half. Right? And then it started slowly, slowly to grow again. Or my home city, uh, Vienna, in, in in 1916, Vienna had more than 2.2 million inhabitants. And then it, 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 it fell, it fell dramatically. And not only, you know, kind of the end of the Habsburg Empire and, and, and uh, we killed all our Jews, but it, it continued to fall for another 35 years, you know, until in, in, 80, in 1981, Vienna had one and a half million inhabitants. It lost a third of its, of its population. And then it started growing again. Now it's uh, above uh, 1.9 1, 1. million. But it can also be shorter. And I think that there might be some optimism in this. When, when you look at uh, um, new member states, or well, re ra relatively new member states in the, in the EU, uh, quite a few of them actually have, have, have managed to, to, to reach the, the, the tipping point. Slo Slovenia actually, according to Eurostat data, uh, is, is, is growing again since, since 2000. The Czech Republic since 2004. Eurostat says also that Slovakia is growing since 2005. I'm not sure we might sort that out in the, in the break. And, and more recently we have uh, Estonia since 2000, I think you, Tim, pointed that out, that in, in the Baltics they started to grow again. Es Estonia grows since 2000, well, modest, really modestly, but they have, I think, reached this point. They grow since 2018, and, and Lithuania since 2019. So I think a, a, a lot here, what is clear, and I think what Senate also pointed out yesterday, and Misha Glenny, kind of EU membership definitely helps, right? Um, and so I think we would definitely need to address this in the Western Balkans. We can also talk. Uh, later a bit about how we could do this, because at the moment this process is completely uh, stuck and not uh, delivering any progress, which is to a quite big degree also our uh, own fault. But then, of course, when you look at Bulgaria, no, EU membership is not all. Um, so I think quite clearly, you know, strength and institutions, it's not only about, I think, money and income, it's about strength and institutions. It, it's about the rule of law, that people basically feel, uh, feel safe. And maybe it's also about education. I think it's not a coincidence that the two of countries who, who started to grow again, Estonia and, and Slovenia, who are also doing economically really well, uh, have basically dramatically reformed their education systems and, um, and now belong to, to the EU member states with, with best systems. You give examples, uh, Vienna, Ireland, um, I can't refrain from giving the Swedish example. Uh, Sweden, uh, in the second half of the 19th century, loses uh, almost a third of its population. A uh, big part of them die because it's not enough to eat. Uh, and uh, the majority, though, leaves for the US. And there are more Swedes, relatively speaking, leaving for the US than there are Italians or, or Irish. Uh, and uh, the 20th century, however, is a success story for, for Sweden, which means that you have the, the things change. This is, I think, the, the point. So the Swiss leave for, for uh, or left for the, for the US. Um, okay, you were, you were in the US, uh, I think just before the pandemic hit, right? And you were looking into uh, not California, Los Angeles, or not New York, but you were looking into uh, what demographic developments uh, were taking place in central US. Could you tell us about that? Yes, um, hello to everybody. Thank you for coming so early on 
uh, on a weekend. Um, yes, I, I take you from what you said about Sweden, about Ireland, and about um, uh, Vienna to raise a question uh, which had come to my mind when I was listening to the, uh, to the debate. Is it really bad that a country is shrinking? So is less, does, is it necessarily mean uh, worse? Because as you said, things change. It takes a long time for them to change, but they do change. Um, demography is like waves, they come and they go, but it is, it, it's, it is a long, long process. Migration is the thing that speeds it up, uh, but uh, demography in itself, you can't change it in a year or 10 years. It takes a long time. Um, this is why I want, um, one of the reasons I went to the US is actually this, because as uh, Tim pointed out, the European Union is not a country. Uh, the US is a country, and the dynamics there are different than those in the uh, European Union, because people are born in one place and they, they migrate to another and then they migrate to another, uh, and they might come back or they might not, but it's not a tragedy. It's not, it's not a demographic catastrophe, uh, catastrophe for Ohio, for example, because it's losing people. It's, it's a problem that they, they try to deal with, but it's not a catastrophe. Uh, and I wanted to see how this dynamics works, actually, in a place that's already been a state for 300 years. Uh, because my opinion is that the European Union is moving towards this dynamic. And at some point we'll get there, but it's going to probably take a long time to do it. People are starting to look at migration in the European Union as mobility. Uh, because you can take a plane from Plovdiv and go to Milano in two hours. And that's a game changer. I mean, anytime you want to come back to, to Plovdiv, it takes two hours. Uh, if you want to come back, of course. But that's connected to the factors that you already said. Uh, salaries, way of uh, living, uh, quality of life, uh, rule of law, and, uh, and so on. But uh, to go back to your question about the US, yes, there are cities in the US that are now growing, and they were shrinking before. And they're in the middle of the country. Because historically, what, what has been happening in the US, and, Take it, you all know it. People have been leave, uh, leaving their home cities to move to the two coasts where the economic centers are. But there are now centers in the US which are growing, which are far, far from the coasts. And Austin being the prime uh, example of that, this is the fastest growing metropolitan area in the US. It, has, it hasn't been growing 30 years ago. It's been growing uh, very fast. It's been attracting people, money, resources, you name it. Um, Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas, but it's possible and Ireland also is the same example in Europe. Ireland has been shrinking a lot. Ireland has been losing population. Ireland has been having difficult economic times. But Ireland, as uh, it was pointed out in the previous uh, debate, is now uh, steadily growing. And the, most prosperous. and the most prosperous. So things change. This is my, this is my perspective. Things change. Uh, yes, the cent I can speak from, of course, Eastern European perspective. And Eastern Europe has, is the only region in the world that's been shrinking for three consecutive decades without a war. This was before the Ukrainian war, and the war has made it worse. So this is a huge challenge, of course, but I wouldn't say it's a predicament. I wouldn't say it's like the end of story. That's, that's my viewpoint. I can go into details on every of these points. If you no, I, 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 I want... Uh, to, to, to state it, but because what do you see when you look at Ohio or, or you look at Austin? Uh, what do you see that is, would be applicable uh, if you look at this part of the world and this part of Europe? So that, first of all, let me state that there are fundamental differences between how Americans see their home cities and how Europeans see them. Europeans are very more, are very much more connected to their home place and to the, to the city that they grew in because of historical reasons, social reasons, economic reasons, nostalgia. Uh, so this is what's driving this debate, actually. Uh, speaking about whether Bulgaria is shrinking is because of the feeling that we are getting less and less, like your tribe is getting smaller. This is, a, this is, this is not an uh, economic term. This is a human term. You, you feel it emotionally. Um, economically, it will be a problem at some point, but we've looked at it. I, I and my colleagues have looked at it, and Bulgaria will deal with it. I mean, economically, Bulgaria is, uh, has figured in 
the, the numbers that are shrinking, and we will be having troubles with the system, say, in 50 years in time. But, but it's not catastrophe. It's, it's what it is. Um, so I just wanted to point out the difference between the US and the, in, in Europe and why it will take a long time to get there. But my research lately, in the past three to four years, has been focused on cities because um, I, I don't want to talk about countries because I do believe that people live in cities, not in countries. Uh, like what you, what you care about mostly is about the city that you live in. The country is a good, is a good area that you inhabit, but city is where you live day to day. And what matters to you is what happens there. And what cities do make a difference. Uh, for example, Denver, which is one of the fastest growing cities also in the US, has started growing 30, 40 years ago with some solutions that the mayor then found to their, to their problem, which is building a new airport, uh, bringing in companies with it, and stuff like that. So it's, it's manageable. They, people can do things that actually affect how cities grow or not. Uh, it takes a long time, but it is possible. And this is why I'm looking at, uh, at um, Eastern Europe now, because there are examples in Eastern Europe of cities that are already growing. Cluj in Romania is one example. Plovdiv in Bulgaria, where I live, is another example. It's slowly growing, but it's growing. Um, it, can, it can do much more if it makes more effort, but it takes concentrated effort. Um, that there's a whole other story about villages, and we can go into that if you want the rural areas. But cities, I don't think cities are doomed. Like some cities are not, definitely. We'll, I, I think we will get back to this um, metaphor or, or the... the the comparison that Tim made to uh, the urbanization area and uh, what we're having now. We can come back to that later. But what we have done now is that we've identified, I think, at least three potential problems with shrinking communities or shrink shrinking regions uh, or so on. One would be the urban problem, which uh, you now describe in more emotional terms as uh, uh, the attachment to a place or identification with a, a, a home or a nation, and which could also be then stated in, in national or nationalist terms, which would be the urban problem, right? The other problem would be economy, that you, you, you don't have development in this, uh, in this area, and that in that area would then also uh, uh, include things like medical services and, and, and stuff like that. And the third one, would then be, which we have not mentioned uh, now, but which was touched upon slightly yesterday, and I think it's a really, really important one, is uh, the undermining of possi the possibility of political reform. Because uh, one could at least argue that some of the people who are choosing to, prior to, to pick up what Veronica said, uh, to, to prioritize themselves and their families and leave, uh, would have been the ones that would have been the driving force in political reform in their home countries so for development for uh, on economic terms but also on, on, on other terms. So you have these, uh, these three areas. And how could one then, let's, let's leave the urban part uh, out of it because we, 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 we discussed that before. But the other two, when, um, uh, what would be the measures, Christoph, that one could, uh, uh, apply in order to uh, address these two, uh, uh, the, the two later problems there? Or are they problems at all? I'm not sure. Um, essentially, I think people, and that has always been the case, and it's still the case, people uh, tend to move to places where there are higher prospects, you know, uh, from places where the, there are lower prospects for a um, prosperous, uh, stable, happy life. And uh, I think a lot of people kind of move if, if, if a place is not able to offer, uh, uh, I think that's a key, a key determinant in this is, is um, jobs, right? And, and, and I think people move away as long as this is not uh, changing. And I think people will move along, away from Bulgaria as long as Bulgaria is not attractive enough for those people to say, I, 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 I want to stay here, and for others to come. And, and maybe, I think, 
that's a thing clearly to think about. Um, and I think we, have, we, we see this slowly, no? kind of we see it in Romania, we see it also in Poland, we see it in Hungary, we have immigration from Asia, uh, uh, from other parts of the, the, the world to, to these countries. And yeah, I think that, that's, that's also something which, which uh, needs to sink in in society. It's new, it, there are certain challenges related to this. Um, but eventually, I think, once, you know, we say all these people move away from Bosnia, move away from, from, from Bulgaria, if then there is really a demand uh, for workforce, the workforce will come, you know? Maybe one needs to be a little bit more open for that uh, and can also think about this more strategically and not do it like, I don't know, the Germans and the Austrians in, in, in the 60s and 70s of having this illusion, you know, sharing the illusion actually with the labor migration which, or, um, migrant workers which arrived, that this is only for a short time and that they will basically uh, go back in a few years, but immediately think about, you know, how do we integrate these people in, into our societies. Uh, so I think that, that's clearly a way to, 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 to think about this. And I, I somehow share this, this view that, you know, there's not very much you can do. I think there are no measures where you say, you know, we, 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 we can limit this, you know. If people move, they move. Yeah. Uh, there is, uh, I've registered one uh, question in the audience, but before, uh, so I remind you, just raise your hand and you will uh, get your say, but before we take uh, that audience, uh, 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 Ognian, uh, coming back to the pandemic, uh, because there was, a, there was actually a, a, a kind of contraintuitive or at least uh, uh, different development during the pandemic, uh, uh, specifically in, in Bulgaria, where this flow of uh, people turned, right? Could you tell us about that? It wasn't in Bulgaria only, it was registered everywhere in the world. This was an, a singular event that actually turned the tides of migration backwards, like people were leaving back to their home countries. It happened in India, it happened in Pakistan, it happened in uh, lots of European countries, it happened in Romania, in Bulgaria. There are lots of people who were working abroad who then decided to go back to the places they were originally from. And I, I just happened to be here and I studied it. And it's, it, it was a singular event. I, Are there long-lasting effects? Are these this, people this still is, here? This is, this is a, a good question. I think it's far too early to say, but from what we did as a survey back then, lots of people um, were here for safety and uh, social networks, uh, like the network that can support you when you're sick, uh, they wanted to visit their parents because they were afraid and so on, so on. This has gone away now that the COVID is away. Um, but it's a, f it's a fundamentally different thing, and we're talking about remigration here, how the people migrate back to the places where they're uh, from. It's a fundamentally different perspective when you are, for example, in the UK and when you're thinking, what, should I return to Bulgaria? And when you're in Bulgaria already, establishing yourself back in your place and thinking whether I should go back to the UK, it's a fundamentally different perspective. And I think some of those people who are here are here to stay. From our survey, there weren't many. There were like 10 to 15% of people who are suggesting that they, they will stay. I would say that's still a significant boost if they stay. That's still a significant boost for the local economies because it's a boost that you didn't expect. You didn't expect those people to come back. Um, but then you had another singular event, which is the war. And um, to me, the, of course, the war is devastating to Ukraine and to the region because it's shedding lives apart, killing millions. And it's also, I think, I, I hope I might be wrong, but it's, um, it might delay the, 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 the cresting of the wave that we've seen in Central and Eastern Europe, people are starting to come back because of um, imagery. Um, I'll try to explain what I mean. Um, for decades, the images that you've seen of, Central, uh, of Eastern Europe, basically, in the West, were of uh, um, crumbling infrastructure of gray blocks and abandoned places. And it took decades for this image to change. It took decades for the countries to develop and to project a more um, positive image of themselves. 
and the Russian tanks are now dragging us back to, to where we were, and this is awful in lots of ways. Uh, I think in imagery, not, not nonetheless. Um, yeah. Quick comment on that, uh, Christoph, and then uh, the first question from the room. We're thinking of this, of this other development, the war. I mean, uh, and it's, it's, it's uh, more of a question also to you, because I think mm, here there must be people who know much better. Uh, 151,000 Ukrainians have applied for protection in Bulgaria. Yeah. Uh, that's quite a lot. That's 2% of your population, essentially, right? Um, and as we've discussed in the former session, it's, it's not so easy to say what these people are going to do. There's, there's one study in Germany, which is done by, by the um, kind of uh, labor office, immigration office uh, um, um, and the uh, Wirtschaftsforschungsinstitut, I think. Um, and it's quite uh, big. They have uh, interviewed uh, 11,000 Ukrainians. And they say kind of a quarter, a quarter says that they definitely want to stay in Germany. Another 11% say they definitely want to stay for a, a few years at least. And only one third said they want to go back when the war ends. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. These things can change and I mean, it's one poll. Yeah, uh, so they, they, they take with, with care. But I know, I mean, uh, how is this in, in, in Bulgaria? No? And I, I, I think it would be a bad idea to kind of, you know, try to, I don't know, how, how shall I put that, suck people out of Ukraine to stay in Bulgaria, right? But I'm <laughs> sure there are people who want to stay and who will stay anyways, no? So thinking about how one can make it easier for those people and what can one offer them, uh, I think would make sense, also from this demographic um, perspective. Right. I can, yeah. Very briefly, and then I can very briefly finally. try to answer, and then there yeah. are people in the audience that can probably answer it better. Um, not all of them stay in Bulgaria, so there are lots of that are registered, and then they move to Western Europe or to other places. Uh, but then they don't get. You cannot register at two places. Um, um, I don't know if you can register, but I know for sure that not all of the registered Ukrainians are not here. Some of them left to Germany, Italy, and other places. Um, Bulgaria is well positioned in terms of um, closeness to Ukraine in language, church, relations before that. So there are hubs in Bulgaria that can actually attract Ukrainians, and they stay, some, some of them stay. Um, but I, I don't know how lasting this will be, and I'm not sure how, um, how can we, um, I don't know, integrate them if they want to move to Western Europe, as most of the Central and Eastern Europeans want to do at the present time. So, first question from the audience, and uh, I remind you, just raise your, ha your hand, and uh, if you're interested, and if you asked the question uh, in the previous discussion round, it doesn't disqualify you to ask a question now. So, please. Hi. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Kofa Publisher. Uh, it's not that much of a question as it is a comment. Uh, gentlemen, I'm really surprised by the mechanistic approach that has been taken since the morning, uh, including, by the way, the Bulgarian and the Romanian representative, which, which surprises me even more. Um, you're, pushing, you're pushing the perspective all the time toward workforce, toward labor, toward can we find jobs, toward mo uh, freedom of movement and all that. Point well taken, but... And, and uh, Carl brought that up, the political, the political perspective, you know. I, I, I'm speaking actually from experience. I've been in Bulgarian parliament two terms, very short terms. The first one was nine days, the second one 45, but still I've been in Bulgarian <laughs> parliament. So I've seen things from the inside. What really concerns me is the people who leave, not because they cannot find work here, but because of the institutions that don't work, because of the fact that they don't want to be in a cab where they listen to a guy telling them how Putin is right and how, you know, he attacks because the Americans are this and that. So many people leave because they don't like what's happening here on a political level. You know, the... Uh, Right now with the war, it's even more acute because Bulgaria is practically split smack in the middle. And the people who are leaving are the ones that are in many ways the best and the brightest 
Carl, you mentioned that, but it was like an offhand remark. So what ends up happening is that the quality of the political dialogue here is lower and lower by the day. And we keep voting for the same, excuse my French, but assholes. We keep doing that. So it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's at the same time, Germany is taking away the quality, you know, labor from Bulgaria. Okay, that's fine, you know, freedom of movement. But we forget that Germany is scratching their ear when it comes to criticizing the Bulgarian government, actually taking steps. These guys have been in power for 12 years and corruption is everywhere. And Germany is not doing shit. Sorry, but that's, you know, that's how things are. So we're talking also about the responsibility of the center of Europe toward the periphery and toward the fact that they are depriving this periphery of quality, quality people, quality minds, quality of dialogue. Thank you. Yeah, point uh, well taken, I think, and you will get response, uh, responses. Before that, I will just, uh, uh, for the first time now, actually um, implement a lesson I was learned in a pain painful way yesterday by, by Senat, when he shamed me for calling him a representative of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Dubravka Stojanovic is a representative of Serbia. So there, uh, neither Veronika Angel nor uh, Ognjan Georgiev uh, are representing Bulgaria nor uh, Romania. Uh, just wanted to make that thing. And, but I know I gave you time now, Kristof, uh, uh, to uh, uh, collect your thoughts because I saw that, hey, now things get going. Please. No, I, I think I, I more or less agree with you. Um, and I think I mentioned before, no, the, the key thing are, you know, strengths in institutions, rule of law, education, which works well. And yes, um, member states and the European Union can maybe be of some assistance on this. But frankly, I mean, this is up to you, no? This is up to, this, these are things that Bulgaria has to resolve. I think that's, you, you cannot rely on, on the Germans to, to solve your institutional problems here. I think that's, that's just not going to fly. Then you will wait for a long time. I think you, you, sorry? They can drain our workforce and the rest of the crisis, but at the same time, not do anything about the fact that a member of the European Union is corrupt in their class. So, uh, it doesn't work that way. It does. It and does. unfortunately, <laughs> the speech, wait, 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 the, the speech situation also doesn't work uh, because, uh, you know, things are recorded and other people will we want a big audience and so on. So I just repeat that. It's, it's an accusation about the, the, the moral stance of some uh, Western European countries uh, not acting on uh, political developments I I in the neighborhood. Well, I, I think there are two, 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 I should say, Par, parts to this. One is kind of what can, I don't know, let's say the EU uh, institutionally do, do to help. And I think we have seen over the last years that there is a certain awakening. Well, first there was an awakening that we have some problems in EU member states with regard to institutions and the rule of law. And there is a, uh, an awakening that also actually there are things which can be done. Look at Poland and uh, the rule of law, basically the complete hijacking of the independent judiciary of Poland by essentially one man, the Justice Minister Giobro. Uh, and look at what the commission um, and in particular also the, the Court of Justice have been doing. Essentially the Court of Justice has, has been waving uh, a, a little flag and saying, hey, we are here actually, you know, we, 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 we can take this up, right? Uh, which is a change uh, which has occurred through a ruling in, uh, about Portugal, which was effectively unrelated, but to say we basically can uh, take issues up and we say that the, 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 it's not kind of guaranteed anymore that there is uh, access to an independent uh, 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 court proceeding in a member state anymore. This is ongoing, you know, it's, it's a huge battle and, you know, there are 
quite a lot of member states and also people in the commission who would rather like to basically solve this somehow and find some phony compromise and make the money flow to, to Poland now also because of the war in particular, etc. But there is, I think there is an element and I think there is some potential yeah, to, to address these issues more strongly from the, from the uh, also from kind of the, the EU sides and um, but I would not kind of, you know, lay back and, and wait for them to um, resolve these problems. I think the, the, the main responsibility still lies in, in the member states and in the societies of the, of the member states. And now when you say they draw, well, they draw, yeah, I mean, but it's free choices, you know. It's, it's Bulgarians who decide they, they don't want to, I don't know, talk to these cab drivers anymore or look at Boris, uh, uh, sort of uh, Borisov's uh, face again and basically decide to go into this plane and 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 go to Germany. I'm not really sure if if, if we can blame the Germans for this. In particular when it was it was pretty clear, no, we have the Europe is based on the four freedoms, movement of of, of goods, uh, uh, people, capital, services, and this is part of the uh, of the thing. Now I, I understand sort of no 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 I don't I, Sorry, sorry, I don't allow that. So we, we, uh, we, we uh, continue. Uh, so it's, I, I do think that this question is extremely relevant. It seems now that we're moving away from the demographic issue and start to talk about the European Commission, court, uh, uh, European Court, and so on. But of course, it's a very relevant uh, remark to say that it's not only about economic pull factors and you know, uh, things like that. It's also about political situations and, and landscapes on on in the in individual places and in the European Union as a whole. Sorry that you had to wait to, uh, so long to comment no, on the question, no, but it, as, as an individual comment, not <laughs> as a Bulgarian one, please. And, uh, it was interesting hearing this conversation. Um, I, I get the anger and I totally agree, but the entry into the European Union, you know, uh, Union has always been a deal. You take the money and you open up your markets and you open up your people. So you lose your people when you take the money. This is what happens in the periphery. This has always happened in the periphery. Finland has been losing people. Italy has been losing, south of Italy has been losing people. Portugal has been losing people to the center. The periphery always loses out to the center. Um, I, I get it that we are sad and I get it that it's angry that it's happening, but unless, and you're completely right, unless we are the ones who take up this challenge, and we figure out ways of dealing with it, nobody else is going to save us from this. Like, um, of course, <laughs> of course it's, uh, it's, it's uh, useful for the Germans to take Bulgarians abroad, uh, to, take, to take Bulgarians ab uh, on board uh, and not say anything about how Bulgaria is governed, and this is a problem. I do agree, and I've talked to Germans, and I've talked to the European Commission about it in the past 12 years a lot. Uh, but after those 12 years, I'm utterly convinced that nobody's going to save us from abroad, and it's only our uh, own solution how to, how to deal with it. And yeah, I know, I know why it makes us angry. I know why it makes us uh, sad, if you want. But um, I, I don't know. I refuse to look for salvation otherwise. We uh, only have about 15 minutes, so I will ask uh, those of you who ask questions now to be really, really short. I have one question here with Robert, then the gentleman in red, and just in front of him. So I have three registered questions uh, so far, and a fourth uh, from uh, Nikolai uh, uh, out there. So first, Robert. Yeah, very brief, but uh, only a remark. Uh, uh, what I uh, don't like in uh, manual command and generally, uh, we shouldn't uh, also generalize the migration too much <coughs> when we say that the best is going. That is in large degree true, but I would say many people go, not to say everyone is going, so different uh, uh, part of the population are emigrating, and I think this is associated with what was previously said by uh, 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 that uh, it's the perception of what makes, uh, makes you happy, because actually very often we have another phenomenon that people who immigrate feel that as the realization of themselves, and then usually they also tend to be nationalistic and exclusivistic. So all our Balkan diaspora, 
when they go to the Western multicultural society, they don't become more democratic, more tolerant. On the contrary, they tend to support the worst assholes <coughs> back in the country that were mentioned. So it's not uh, that easy and, uh, and, and uh, to be understood uh, properly. What is also a tragic is that not always uh, uh, the, skill f the skilled workers and educated workers find their dream work. They are ready to work whatever job, and this is tragedy. They have been skilled for one, and they are good in one profession. They leave that, and they find any work that will bring a better salary. Thank you, Robert. A quick response to that. I, uh, there are risks in collection, collecting questions, so I think it's better if you respond to, to, to the question immediately. Um, yeah, I wouldn't generalize also. Um, from speaking about this dynamic that I was speaking in the beginning, where the US is a country and the European Union is not, I think as we are moving ahead, more and more we'll be dependent on local authorities. And I say this because I've been looking into dynamics. We are in a fight for talent. When we, every city that we live in is a fight for talent. You live in Plovdiv and you fight for a talent to, 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 to find. And, it's, and because we live in a, in a um, um, common union, it's a fight for talent everywhere. You don't fight. And I had this conversation with mayors in Bulgaria and they seem, unable to understand it yet. You're not fighting with your neighbor cities. You're fighting with Milan, you're fighting with Nice, you're fighting with Paris, you're fighting with uh, Sweden. This is, the, this is the place you're fighting with. You, you are fighting for talent. You just need to up your game, this is it. I mean, you need to be better at what you're doing. And we have, I'm sorry to say, but we have tons of mayors who are not good at what they do, and this is a problem. Uh, and, and cities are not getting better. And because cities are not getting better, people are leaving. Now, the political choices of those people when they leave uh, are something that I wouldn't go into comment now, but this is my viewpoint. My viewpoint is that <clears throat> you need to start making small steps in order to make this, the places where you live better, and then you have a chance on this fight for talent. Everything else is good, and it's very good imagine to imagine that this would change, but in my opinion, it's not very realistic. So, uh, gentlemen in the back. Uh, thank you, Karl Henrik. Um, I want to emphasize on the last things that Ogi said, um, uh, and I want to move the perspective back from the cities to the states, um, because uh, I really liked uh, in the beginning that he, he reframed the discussion for migration to a discussion for mobility. Because it's nowadays it's not a question of, uh, of, of, of a country, of a nation, it's a country of choice. Since this has been the fundamental promise of the European Union. And I'm continuing on, 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 on this. Uh, what can be done institutionally to change the framework of the European Union to start adopting policies and to start adopting discussions on a higher political level that can evaporate this never-ending struggle to, uh, to push the blame game who is responsible for development in a, in a local, uh, local, local country, local market, local community. Because it's, as Augie said, it's not, it's not a country anymore, it's a community. Um, what can we do to adjust the taxation system? In the European, we have like, uh, European Union, we have uh, 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 almost 30 uh, different, uh, different uh, VAT uh, rates. Uh, what can we do to adjust the, the educational system? In every country, the biggest problem is always the identity question because every country continues to fight 150 years later for an identity question, whether we, we used to be great or not. And it seems like for the newer generations, for the TikTok generations, if I can refer to the discussion of yesterday, it doesn't give a damn whether we were great. It's the question what unites us and what can bring us forward. And then it would, it, would be, it would be more interesting. So my question would be, to formalize it, um, what can be done to, to, to elevate this on a higher political level? So I, I'm, I'm sure that some of the success representatives of some of the successful uh, EU member states uh, in, uh, economically and so on, let's say Slovakia, uh, Czech Republic, Ireland, that choose to compete with uh, no taxes at all, actually, and, and, and so on, would have an argument with that. Do you want to respond quickly? 
Right, maybe just briefly. Uh, I think we, we have, of course, a, a quite dramatic problem in the European Union that sort of the gap between rich and poor is increasing. And it's increasing in a way which I think is not sustainable, right? Um, on the other hand, I think we also see that, you know, Europe, Europeanizing kind of more issues like, you know, uh, taxes or education, yeah? I just don't see it happening. I think it's the member states who want to do it, and, and it has also been one of the sort of advantages, you know, that Bulgaria has a lower tax rate than other countries, so there was more foreign direct investment. I mean, all debatable, but I think the thing is just, I don't really see a, um, a, a bigger movement in this direction of kind of, you know, putting more European, uh, uh, developing more policies at the European level. Uh, I don't really see it. And, and you also see that, ironically maybe, kind of the far right who I think manages best to attract those voters who are frustrated, who feel to have been left out of the progress in the European Union, that they essentially say, oh, we need much less Europe, right? So um, I think there would be quite a lot of potential for um, mainstream party to really reconfigure um, their electoral programs, but that unfortunately also don't see yet. Mm. Okay. I also think that it's very, I don't know, very far in the future if we are going to see anything like this happening. Um, that's why I, I emphasize on the local, because on the national level, I, I can hardly see uh, how can, how can this debate even be started? Like, what are they going to do in order to help? There is lots of talks in the European Union of how the periphery can be helped. The cohesion funds are basically this. They are sending money to the periphery in order to, to develop. Now, the thing is that the cohesion money is also the way to corrupt local elites. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I don't, see, I don't see in the near future uh, something that's going to change this dynamic. So, uh, this will now be the last question. Uh, Nikola Machirov, uh, I think you have a mic, or? Uh, ah, sorry, sorry. I, I was so proud that I actually managed to get everything, and now I forget. I'm very sorry. Please. No, this is fine. So, I'm this is the second the, last to, question. To be the last. Okay. My second attempt at being the last was successful. So, uh, yeah. So, I'm Anja Petrov, a Bulgarian journalist. The, the, the two guys know me, but just for you, Carol. So, uh, I am really happy to uh, to hear that over the course of uh, uh, of this of the discussion, focus has shifted a bit to local authorities for a simple reason. We have given examples of countries that apparently have been or are becoming now bit by bit more successful in what increasing their population, uh, uh, retaining or attracting migration. But I think this is misleading. Like population numbers are like GDP; they don't give you the whole picture. Because you go to, to a city, you go to a capital city, or to another city, which Ognia has mentioned, or you go to a village, which, yes, of course, could be another point of discussion. But what connects most of the countries in Europe is that already, okay, if not most, but some countries, like what connects Bulgaria with Italy, with Spain, with part of Scandinavia, maybe, is the formation of the so-called demographic deserts. We have entire regions where, regardless of whether a country has high GDP, where people in big cities have good, good living standards, whether, whether villages are depopulating fast or quickly. Entire regions, entire ecosystems are being gradually wiped out because people are looking for a better life, because it looks inevitable that you leave small places for larger ones. But I wonder if you have, have any take on that, because I can see areas in the northwest of Bulgaria. In central Spain, I think one of the previous people who wanted to ask a question was referring to that. The, central, the center of Spain is hollowing out around Castilla, La Mancha, Castilla. So do you see any solution to that, to be brief? Yeah, this is then the, the urbanization issue again, as it, meaning that the East and Western dynamics is actually mirrored on a national level as well. Please, okay. I have a, an answer, but I'm not sure you're going to like it. Um, yeah, but that doesn't, in, uh, shouldn't in, refrain you from, from uh, uttering it. Um, I've also been thinking about that and been tracing the, the statistics and talking to people. Um, my 
perception is that some places are doomed. Uh, and my perception is that some places in Bulgaria, but also in other countries, are beyond the point where you can save them. For example, north, uh, far north of Bulgaria. Because there is a level of, I think, educated people and people who work and people who mm, reproduce and stuff, that, that underneath it, it's very hard to revive this region again with normal measures. Um, and I think by looking at what's been happening, I think that you can divide the countries into several layers. The first layer is, of course, the capitals. The capitals are go always going to be okay. Sofia is richer than anything uh, all the way up to Vienna. Um, then there are second tier cities, which are still able to attract people, and with some effort, they're able to grow very fast. Then you have the third layer of cities that are on the brink of starting to disappear, but they still manage to hold on. But I think in the near future, we're going to unfortunately see that. And then there are places who are doomed and they, nothing you can do about it. And it's not, you ask how to save them, I would ask whether it's worth saving them. Because if people leave them, if people don't want to live there, is it worth saving it? I mean, it's good historically. It's a very nostalgic thing. But how? What, what will you do in order to save them? And I will give you a, just, I'm finishing. Um, I'll give you a recent OECD um, research that's been done into, after COVID, people moved out of the big cities and in all of the countries. Uh, so they did a research in OECD countries and where did people move um, uh, post-pandemic. And most of the people that moved out of the big cities moved either to the outskirts of the big cities, either to medium-sized cities. Almost, oh, it was a very small percentage that moved to the rural areas. People don't want to, I don't know, it's, it's a very good idea of living in a rural area, but people don't seem to want to go there for reasons of being, if you want, disconnected from the world. I don't know. So this is my take on it. I don't know. Christoph, very briefly. I think you are right to a certain extent. Some regions, I think, are doomed. But I think it's also interesting to think about, you know, how, how, how at least regions at the balance basically can be saved. And I think there, EU funds can have a real important role. I know in Austria, at the, the border, when you move basically outside of Vienna, when you did this in the late 80s, you know, 45 kilometers basically, and you hit the Iron Curtain. And this was so visible, and it was so clear. You know, you end, basically, you, you drove towards a one -way, the end of a one-way street, and it became poor, and it became empty, and it became very depressive. And um, thanks to EU funds, a lot of these regions actually have really dramatically re recovered. They are really nice to visit now. It's really very, very different how, um, how it used to be. Um, so I think uh, in this, that there, there, there could be a real role. And I understand also kind of the anger of you, know, you who said kind of, you know, um, Germany is watching basically um, the Bulgarian government basically uh, filling their pockets. Uh, so to think of better ways and I can, a reform of kind of EU fund spending would be maybe something which would really be interesting and which, which, which would, to think about, you know, how, how can one target them better and actually reduce levels of corruption because at the moment the European Union basically asks NGOs to, I don't know, show all the boarding passes of the return flights, right? But basically it doesn't matter if basically billions sick somewhere uh, in, 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 in um, uh, certain member states, right? So maybe something there is wrong, I, I agree. And why not I have a Bulgarian, Romanian, Polish kind of initiative of you know, maybe people have already looked into this deeper, but you know, how to concretely do this? And 20 I seconds. Brussels, 20 just seconds. Another, this is the fastest way to answer the question of what can Europe do? This is the fastest way to create a transnational effort is to take the money out of the uh, governments and to bring them, say, to Brussels or to some to Brussels to actually coordinate these efforts to revive the, the regions because the governments will be proving unable to do it. So call for centralization. Uh, uh, basically, uh, I, I promise that Nicola Matira will be the last to ask uh, uh, a question. Uh, 
it's a lot to dwell upon here, actually, but uh, time uh, flies. So please, uh, Nicola, try to be short. And uh, we try to be short as well, and then we'll be almost in time. I know from uh, experience from poetry festivals, thank you, Carl Hennig. When someone says on the stage, I will be very short, it never ends, but I will be short now. And I want just to give another, let's say, point of view of uh, migration of uh, these topics, let's say the linguistic one. Uh, for example, when, uh, when someone leaves, goes away from the country or, or for a better life, usually um, uh, they say, I, I, I'm going to leave. They don't say, I go. But they say, I leave. And this put, puts inside him eternal guilt that is leaving something behind. And this guilt, as Robert pointed, uh, make these people extreme uh, nationalists because they always feel uh, and live with this uh, feeling of, ex of uh, eternal guilt. Um, and the other one is to open this uh, emotional uh, geography uh, topics. Like when it's, it's interesting because it looks, when I see this, word Europe, you know in Macedonia the first and the oldest factory for chocolate was called Europa. So for us we always, Europe will something sweet and we have, we, we really live with this kind of sweetness of, of Europe and, and whenever someone wants to go uh, um, uh, west or east people say I will go up upper, no matter go south or, or west. So it's a matter of someone also the linguistic way to pull please pull me up if they have relatives there. So they want to be pulled up from here. And, and in this, uh, um, and the other, uh, what I want to point is the phenomenon of return that um, Ognon opened and nostalgia and the future of nostalgia of uh, Svetlana Boyn, she pointed out that it's matter of, not only matter of changing spaces, but only also matter of changing uh, time, living in other time. And the time migrants, especially in their post-communistic countries, are the biggest, uh, I think, burden for the society because no single statistics uh, register them, but they are inside in the time. That's what I wanted to say, live in, back in time and um, in other ideology, and they don't do anything, the society, to go further. Thank you, uh, Nicola. I will actually take that as a comment because it's a, a, a beautiful uh, summary of, 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 of the so-called, as, as a kind of psychological uh, uh, approach to this. Uh, and it also makes, is it possible for me to uh, point to what is happening on Sunday where uh, Georgo Gospodinov uh, will certainly address that element of time uh, in his closing speech, uh, this is on uh, Sunday uh, morning. Before that, however, we will meet here again uh, at 7 o'clock uh, tonight uh, when uh, Ivan Krastev will talk to Alek Popov, uh, moderated by Biljana Kortasheva. Uh, and um, uh, I urge you to come back here. From a practical point of note, before I, I, I close this, there will be Taxis, if I understand it correctly, waiting for the participants, the delegates of the of of the this debates on Europe uh, gathering to take us to the place where we will now have lunch. But before we uh, enter those uh, cabs, I would like to uh, join me in a big uh, round of applause for not only for Christoph and Oggy, but also for uh, Veronica and Tim, and for an extremely interesting Saturday morning. Thank you so much. Thank you.